Before I start this video, I just want to thank you guys for your support. The love and support you all been showing is amazing and motivates me to make more videos for you guys. If you like these videos, make sure to subscribe, it would mean so much. With that being said, let's get into the video. To the party. I'm up to Molly the Zen and Lean, that's why I'm moving retarded. That's why I'm moving left, right, left, right, and then left. With a foolish friend was a ox. Kai left the bridge and we we with the nine. You got Sonny Common, welcome to the, the party. You shot it, nigga? Welcome to the party. Oh, you gave bitches? Welcome to the party. From Canarsie, Brooklyn. Where we get you. of gun violence across the country this weekend. Between Friday and Sunday, at least 10 cities reported mass shootings. Those are shootings with four or more victims. People want, want for this kind of violence to even stop. You know, uh, you won't know it until you get out there and you, you, you march in those streets and do the beat in those streets and walk those sidewalks and knock on those doors. the gang blamed for the murder of Lissandra Guzman Feliz. The same gang is now linked to two violent stabbing attacks. It is a Dominican gang the NYPD has been watching and fighting for years. Here's Iowa News reporter N.J. Burkett. The Trinitarios, a notorious Hispanic gang originating from New York by the Dominicans, back in 1993, and were like many gangs in New York, established around that same time in Rikers, which was around the same time UBN, United Bloods Nation, came about. The founding leaders of the Trinitarios, were two Dominicans facing two separate murder charges, and are known as Leonidas Sierra, aka Junito, and his friend Julio Marin, aka Caballo. Trinitarios like many gangs like MS-13, and Latin Kings, were originally created for protection towards their own. The Trinitarios came about in Rikers, and was created to protect other Hispanics but mainly Dominicans from the Afro-American gangs or other Latino gangs, and the Trinitarios later became a street gang. They were named for the three revolutionaries of the Dominican War of Independence with their slogan being Dios, Patria y Libertad, which translates to God, Homeland, and Liberty. As the Trinitarios later evolved into a street gang, it was only a matter of time that the Trinitarios as a gang would become violent and a threat out on the streets. The Trinitarios are known to rep the color green, but also red, blue and white as they are the colors of the Dominican Republic's flag. The Trinitario's origins as I've mentioned is from New York, and has expanded over the east coast of the United States over the years, and have subsets in all five boroughs of New York and in New Jersey, but is also operating in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Rhode Island. It is said that the Trinitario's was established 1993 in Rikers but other sources point that it was established back in 1989, within the New York City Correctional System. The name of the gang is said to derive from the Dominican War of Independence back in the late 1800s as three brave Dominican revolutionaries led their country into rebellion to freedom and independence from Haiti. As I've mentioned earlier, it started out as a way to protect their own from other gangs, who would potentially hurt or threaten them but later evolved to a street gang and became a more standardized enterprise operating both inside and outside of the U.S. correctional system. The Trinitarians have supposedly spread out in other continents as well, as some members moved to South America, Europe, 
and Asia and started operating there. The countries in Europe where they operate are countries like Spain, France, and Italy. To become an official member you had to go through initiations, and either fight someone or get stabbed to be initiated to the Trinitarios. In the 90s, as the gang was getting more established, they got themselves involved with more and more stuff with time, and expanded their activities to earn their money out in the streets. They started selling drugs and weapons trafficking, but are also very known for their violent crimes such as robberies, kidnappings, assaults, rapes, and murders. One of the most notorious sets of the Trinitarios are BTG Bronx Trinitarios Gang and as the name itself entails, it's the Trinitarians from the Bronx, and the Bronx is known for having many Dominicans living there. They have a female clique as well known as the Bad Barbies alongside with the Chico's Malas Bad Boys, the Bad Barbies is the biggest female gang in the Bronx, who was led by Maria Maya. The Trinitarios as I've mentioned are notoriously known for their violent nature as a gang, and have been involved in tremendous amount of violent crimes and murders with a machete as a common weapon of choice but also firearms etc. Sierra ruled as the Trinitarios national leader from New York state prisons, ordering acts of violence against other inmates, and establishing a central committee to deliver his commands to leaders on the street. Sierra is currently serving 22 and a half years to life in state prison for a 1989 murder conviction, according to federal prosecutors and state records. He's set to have even more time behind bars, a federal judge sentenced him to 19 years in 2014 for his role as the Trinitario's leader, a term prosecutors then said will run consecutively to his state sentence. They are an extremely violent gang, that recruits both inside prisons and high schools. Their brutal slayings of rival Trinitarios gang members on the street, have become widely known, and one was even included in a rap song by Cardi B, as an appeal for justice for their victim, who was mistakenly identified. Their weapon of choice is a machete, whether for gruesome public relations effect or to evade shot detection devices used by police that makes catching bad guys easier. In 1980 there were fewer than 200,000 Dominicans in the US, but that figure ballooned to nearly 1 million in 2012. About 75% of those immigrants settled in the New York, New Jersey area, due to family connections, according to the US Census Bureau. About 38% have a high school diploma, and around 80% are between the ages of 18 and 60. They are usually compared to the notorious MS-13 gang, also known for their brutality and bloodshed. In 2011, more than three dozen members of the Bronx BTG, or arm of the gang, were arrested and charged with federal offenses for drug trafficking and conspiracy to murder. Unfortunately, time has shown that sending gang members to maximum security prisons does not stop their influence over street crime, and may even enhance it. As for their brutality, they are very serious about their machetes, and killing people and inflicting paint with it. They think it's more hardcore and raw to kill someone with a machete rather than a gun, Anybody can shoot a gun one member said, and added but if you kill somebody with a knife, that's real. Other than the brutality aspect of it, it also buys you time to get away from a murder with a machete, as it doesn't make any loud noise. Like I mentioned earlier, the leaders and founders of the gang, were Leonidas Sierra and Julio Marine. Sierra managed and lead the Trinitarios while he was an inmate at various New York state prisons, including, at the time of his arrest in this case, 
Attica Correctional Facility. Sierra ordered numerous acts of violence, referred to as green lights in the gang's parlance, against other inmates in the New York State prison system, and, in connection with his guilty plea in this case, also admitted that in 2011, he conspired to murder another member of the Trinitarios gang, who was at liberty in the community. Sierra targeted this victim because the victim refused to acknowledge Sierra as the gang's supreme leader. Sierra and his co-conspirators were arrested in this case, before their plan could come to fruition. In his capacity as the gang's leader, Sierra also ordered the establishment of a central committee, which was responsible for conveying Sierra's orders and messages to the gang's top leadership on the street, among other things. During the time Sierra served as the gang's national leader, Trinitarios members operating in the Bronx, and Manhattan were responsible for numerous homicides and non-fatal shootings, targeting both other members of the Trinitarios and members of rival gangs. Specifically, this office has charged members, and associates of the Bronx Trinitarios gang with committing nine homicides between 2005 and 2010, and members and associates of the Manhattan Trinitarios gang with committing one homicide in 2006. Since 2009, as part of Operation Patria and Operation Green Haze, this office has charged at least 147 members and associates of the Trinitarios gang. There was also another highly ranked member, rumored to have started the Trinitarios with Sierra and Marine, and that was Pedro Nunez, who is also known as El Caballo and was with them in Rikers at the time. As for Julio Marines, he was unfortunately killed in prison, doing his time until he was killed by the prison guards, on January 4, 2010 in Ohio prison in Dominican Republic. Only a week or so later, Another highly ranked member or as they call Suprema was murdered as well by the name of Jose Alberto Tejeda, who is also known as BB, and was killed in Santiago. Then there was the Bad Barbies, as I talked about before who are the female subset of the gang, and is led by Maria Maya, who looked like normal girls, but could be very dangerous and violent. The Trinitarios was primarily based in the Bronx and is also called BTG. As I've mentioned earlier, BTG consisted of many smaller factions and subsets such as the Bad Barbies as I've mentioned, and others like Chicos Malos, El Combo, violating all beaches and one seven hose. Pedro Nunez was sentenced to 18 years back in the day, and was locked up alongside Junito, and Julio Marina and was charged with weapons possession and as the Dominicans who were in Rikers at the time, were heavily abused by Crips, Bloods and even Latin Kings. Pedro Nunez decided that he had enough of this abuse, and alongside Junito and Julio formed Trini. After all the Dominicans united, 
They became a strong unit and had protection inside the prison. They were really low-key at first and acted as a secret society behind bars, and as they grew to a sufficient number, no one could touch them and they started dominating other gangs inside. As the Trinis are primarily operating in the Bronx, they are also known for causing mayhem in Washington Heights, Manhattan, and started a wave of crimes from there through the Bronx and Brooklyn as well with their drug distribution operation and weapons trafficking and their brutal violence towards their enemies. Besides the names I've already mentioned, other notable and highly ranked members were Richard Gonzalez, Carlos Urina, Felix Lopez Cabrera, Edwin Siriaco, Annabel Ramos, Raymond Sosa, Alejandro Soriano, and Antonio Peña. In 1995, things were wild in the Bronx, as there was nearly a murder a day occurring in which, the Trinitarios played a huge part. As for the supplying of their drugs, they managed to import drugs from their motherland of the Dominican Republic, and use dangerous methods to bring it to the states, like swallowing it, or boofing it, meaning inserting it inside of their rectum and the people who did this were so-called mules, which was very deadly, because of the fact that anything could go wrong. For a lot of people but especially the Dominicans growing up in this context, it was wild, and it was dangerous for them and anyone being outside, as there were a lot of gang violence back in the day, and couldn't be avoided with the Crips, Bloods, Latin Kings, Natas and Zulu Nation, causing chaos in the hood. In 1998 the NYPD recorded over 2,000 violent crimes including rape, robbery, burglary, and murder. Back in the day there were a lot of issues between African Americans as the Dominicans were picked on in school for example, and the Dominicans would retaliate for that. In 1999, the Trinis had about a hundred members in New York City, and a brutal and dangerous reputation. They had to go to the extreme to prove themselves out in the streets and show the other gangs and prove that they could compete with them. They quickly grew from there and started attacking their arrivals with machetes and as they grew they expanded over to New Jersey as well, and reached the suburbs of Jersey as there were many Dominicans there as well. All it took was one Trinitario, who started it in Bayonne, and from there spread to Union City and West New York and the Jersey side of Los Trini, were mentored by the New York Trinis on how to sell weapons and manufacture and distribute drugs. With time, the gang became more and more organized, and with that so did the drug trade as well and they grew and spread like a virus. The way the Trinis recruited new and young members, was through high schools which made a lot of kids drop out of school to start working in the streets. The Trinis were serious, about their business and were willing to do whatever it took to prove themselves. The fearlessness the Trinis showed were inspiring to a lot of the young kids, who longed for belonging, protection and a sense of brotherhood, and family and on top of that make some money. The Trinis came out of nowhere from the authorities' perspective, as they were working and recruiting low-key, and worked in secret in Jersey and the authorities didn't know until one day, where a cold-blooded killing occurred which sent the message to the authorities of New Jersey. It came out of nowhere and spread like fire ever since. All of the gang's chapters are organized in the same way, and with their structure, everything is three, there's three tops meaning three heads slash leaders for each chapter with the heads called la cabeza, which means the head in Spanish. The three tops consist of a secretary, treasurer and security slash enforcer, the gang even have an advisor, who handles the members personal business. The advisor is for the members who have personal issues like family and mental issues where they feel like they need to talk to someone.
When you are working with this kind of illegal business, it sometimes leads to you getting caught and arrested, and as the leaders who would get arrested and put into jail, they were quickly replaced and the second in command takes over, and leads the gang. As for the initiations as I mentioned earlier, they had to go through some kind of beating, fight or get stabbed to prove themselves, but if you were recommended by a highly ranked slash certified member, and they already know you're about it and ready to put in work, then you don't have to go through the initiation process. The trainee's code is one of the most important things in their gang, and it's very important that each member follows that code, which is called the seven points which is God, respect, love, peace, courage, nation and liberty. If you messed up, and broke one of their seven points, you would get disciplined, which means you get three people, who are gonna beat you up non-stop for three minutes. If the violation occurs a second time, it's a beating for six minutes and a third time and you're out of the gang. The chapters, have meetings on the regular, where they collect the payment and conduct business, and the money that's collected is just in case if one of the members gets locked up, so they can get sent money in jail. Once a year, all the Trinitarios from New York and New Jersey meet up for a so-called universal, which is a area-wide meeting, so everybody can be a part of what's going on. In August of 2003 at the Dominican Day Parade in New Jersey, the New York Trinis discovered that their brothers from Jersey, had been attacked and issued their secret call to arms, 227, which means it's time to go to war, and the 227 is a code that stands for February 27, 1844, which is the day that the Dominican Republic declared independence. The code 227 meant that something crazy was about to go down in New Jersey, as the day of August 24, 2003, which as I mentioned earlier, is the Dominican's annual day parade, and the police were there and had someone on the rooftop monitoring the parade, and was looking out for any gang activities. Little did they know, that something was about to go down. Four months earlier the Trinis were attacked by their ops, from the 60th Street Gang, and one of the Trinis were stabbed, in which the Trini member luckily survived and the Trinitarios wanted retaliation. The Trinitarios went to their ops turf, and planned an attack on a local schoolyard, and had screwdrivers instead of machetes as it was more discreet and because the police couldn't take them for having screwdrivers in the car. They also sharpened the tip of the screwdrivers for a more effective stabbing with the tool. They arrived at the 60th Street Gang's turf in West New York with two cars and ended up in a corner gas station in 60th Street and Broadway, and they came across a 21-year-old by the name of Jamier Brown, who was affiliated with the gang, and asked him about a member by the name of Moochie, which one of them talked to at the parade. Jamier stood up for his friend, and said that if they had a problem with him, that they would have a problem, and they all jumped and stabbed him and another 16-year-old who was a friend of Jamir, ran up and tried to break it up and ended up getting stabbed as well, but was able to run and escape for his life, and alerted the cops, he was severely wounded and got 19 stitches, and Jamir unfortunately died in the hospital 90 minutes later. This was a clear message towards their ops to never mess with Temil, because if they messed with one of them, they messed with all of them. This murder is what alerted the authorities in New Jersey, that the Trinitarios are in Jersey as well, and it was the first time that many cops there had ever heard of the Trinis. The New Jersey police went after the Trinis immediately, and managed to catch three of them that night. Interrogations didn't start until the morning after, and the first one to be interrogated was the Trinitarian by the name of Alex Colon, and as they viewed tape from the parade, he pointed out members, who were there and so on. Fast forward a few months later in November, the NYPD and NJPD made five more arrests, and a sixth arrest was made a few weeks after the fact, and by March, 2004 they had two more members in custody charged with murder and aggravated assault and two supposed highly ranked members of the Trinitarios were in their custody, one by the name of Ricardo Osorio who was from New York and the other by the name of Pablo Molina was from New Jersey. The prosecutors supposedly had 56 witnesses ready to testify if necessary with one star witness, Alex Colon. Although the authorities thought they had it, 
Alex Colon would unfortunately not make it to the stand. Alex Colon was unfortunately murdered in jail in January 2005, by a fellow inmate, probably for snitching, but couldn't be proved and the prosecution was falling apart as the other potential witnesses got scared. In January 5, 2006 the highly ranked member Ricardo Osario, was about to stand trial and was later convicted of conspiracy to commit homicide, and four months later Ramon Almonte was the next person going on trial, and was convicted of the same charges as Ricardo, and they both got 20 years. The others who were arrested were let out before their trials including Pablo Molina. Nonetheless the Trinitarios were hit with a major blow, and the authorities hoped that this damage would discourage the Trinis. Hoped that the Trinis would disrupt in Jersey but couldn't get any more wrong as they didn't slow down one bit. Beside the BTG, there was the Bad Barbies the female subset of the gang, which was led by Maria Maya back in the day, and is based in the Bronx as well and even though they are women, they should not be underestimated and are very violent, and dangerous. They are known for using the Venus flytrap method, and is a method used as a woman to lure their ops into a machete party, or a hail of bullets. In December 12, 2012, the 24-year-old leader Maria Maya, was arrested and charged with murder, racketeering and assault. Apparently she was involved in a shooting, the year prior in June, as she lured a robbery victim to the front of a Mexican bar, where he was later shot, but not fatally by Jose Maya, her brother, who was waiting with a .45 caliber handgun. Maria pleaded not guilty, and was held without bail. As for her murder charge, it supposedly regarded a murder back in 2005, and involves the death of a Miguel Perez, and was supposedly retaliation for a murder of one of their own Gil Lanier, who was killed by their rival gang, known as Dominicans Don't Play Gang that same week. The way it went down was that Maria spotted Gil, and identified him as a member of DDP, and Miguel was shot and killed. If convicted of the murder, there was a potent ill death penalty on the table. It alleges that Mejia, along with other gang members, allegedly possessed and distributed controlled substances including marijuana, a substance with a cocaine base, cocaine, oxycodone, and suboxone and was therefore charged for her role in a narcotics conspiracy between 2003 and 2012. Finally, as for the three counts charging Mejia with using a firearm in furtherance of a crime of violence, or a drug trafficking crime, these relate, respectively, to Mejia's role in the assault and attempted robbery, the murder, and the narcotics conspiracy. The government mistakenly believed that Mejia had been 18 years old, at the time of the murder and, therefore, was eligible for the death penalty in connection with that offense. The government determined that Mejia and several co-defendants had, in fact, been under age 18 at the time, they allegedly committed the murder. Therefore, 
Mejia could not face mandatory life imprisonment or the death penalty, and the death penalty was off the table. The Bad Barbies was a shock to the authorities, as they know of the Trinitarios, but would never imagine the fact that a female gang would rise and network like this. As for the music scene, there are a lot of rappers coming out of Trinitarios, not any one mainstream at the moment, but has a roster with potential. There are rappers like True 157, Chucky 73, Nelly Nels, Aiden Dinero, GB Tribuvelli, Trip DZ, Rico Fama, Chris Green, Anthony Patria, G Shamo, Blackie Drippy, Doba Montana, True Boy, Tail Igoya, Cappuccino, and last but not least Young Flo, so as you can see they do have a roster of rappers as well. True is known for his songs like Get The Message, and Puta, aka Akuta Remix but besides that there is not a lot of info, if any info regarding him besides his music, and the fact that he represents the green flag for Trinitarios. Chucky73 is also yet another Dominican rapper reppin' the Trinitarios and raps to a more trap slash drill type beat in Spanish, and has released songs like Hmm, Dilly, Terrorita, and Dominicana, Chucky has managed to produce impressive numbers on his music with numbers like 6 million, 27 million, and 24 million on his music videos, and has almost 800 subscribers, which is very impressive. Chucky was born back in 1998 on November 15th, which means he is currently 23 years old, if he is a Trinitario is only alleged, but there has been some green flags in some of his music videos, which could possibly be an indication of a Trini affiliation. At the age of 8 years old, he moved from the Dominican Republic to New York, and grew up the rest of his childhood in the Bronx.
In January this year Chucky was arrested in connection to a November social media stunt that shut down the Kosciuszka Bridge. Chucky was charged with reckless endangerment, unlawful assembly and disorderly conduct. During the evening rush hour stunt, about a dozen men got out of their cars on the Brooklyn span, and rapped along to blaring music, all while filming themselves. Mayor Eric Adams commented about the bridge video on Twitter, calling for all those involved to be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. Incidents like this, damage our brand as a city, disrespect New Yorkers, and endanger visitors and residents alike, he wrote. All those who participated in this reckless behavior, must be found and held responsible to the full extent of the law. Incidents like this damage our brand as a city, disrespect New Yorkers and endanger visitors and residents alike, he wrote. All those who participated in this reckless behavior must be found and held responsible to the full extent of the law. We will not be a city of chaos. Another rapper from the Trinis, is Nell Enels, known for songs like, Si Las Paredes Ableron, and Marao, and Pow with 123000 subscribers on YouTube, coming out of Bronx as well. One of the rappers, who were really talented coming out of Corona, Queens was GB, a supposed Trinitario, as he is often seen repping the green as well, and is known to make drill music, unfortunately his life didn't last, and he was murdered cutting his life short, and dying as a young man. The way it supposedly went down was that GB, and his baby mama got into a conflict over their child, and they had a custody battle for their daughter. The baby mama of GB is the alleged killer of GB, as they were arguing, things got heated and he was then stabbed in the neck unfortunately killing him with no chance of surviving, and died on June 4, 2020. According to the baby mother GB had hurt himself, GB used to watch the child, while the baby mother was hanging out with a boyfriend, that has been allegedly threatening GB with a gun a few times. As she was later charged for the murder it is unknown whether she has received a sentence, but she has claimed self-defense in this regard. Another up-and-coming rapper, who is coming up alongside GB, 
and coming out of Queens as well was Anthony Partria, was a friend of G.B. Tribuvelli, and came from the same set of the Trinis. Known for tracks like Seven Langoons, alongside G.B. among others, I'm a Tree with Part 2, and Train to Go. Anthony Patria is more of an underground rapper and is a very talented rapper, but has had some trouble making it difficult for him to prosper on a higher level with his music. In 2018 he was arrested, on robbery and gang assault charges, with cops claiming he helped rough up a guy he thought was someone else, and then beat up the man's buddies after they came back to see what happened. This occurred on November 18, at the Al Patio Bar in Jamaica, Queens. He was unable to post bail at the time, and based on his Instagram it appears that he is still locked up. Every gang has their allies, and their enemies and the Trinitarios is no exception, when it comes to that part. As for allies, it appears that they don't have any allies, the Trinis is a huge gang, and is speculated to consist of 1,000 members in New York City alone, and is a violent gang, and with the number of people in the gang don't need any other gangs as allies. Although they don't have any allies, they do in fact have many enemies and beef with a lot of gangs, such as the Bloods, Crips, Dominican Don't Play, Latin Kings, Serenios and 60th Street Gang. The Trinitarios is fairly united as a gang, as opposed to other gangs who have a lot of internal conflict. The Trinis have internal conflicts as well, but not to that degree and are a very united gang as they say you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. The way beef started between the Trinis and the Crips, and Bloods is as I've mentioned earlier. Many Dominicans were pressed at school by Crips and Bloods with the Dominicans being a minority back in the day and the Dominicans eventually got tired and started fighting back. Crips slash Bloods, and Trinis were fighting a lot in school and getting into gang brawls. As you already know the Trinis grew bigger and bigger with time to a point, where Bloods, Crips and even Latin Kings came together to go up against the Trinis. In terms of high school the Crips were their biggest rivals, but as a whole, their biggest rivals were their own people DDP. One of their biggest tops are also Dominicans, 
and is the gang known as Dominicans Don't Play, 143, is a gang that started in Manhattan, New York in 1990. They are known for primarily using machetes and knives as weapons. DDP is located across New York City, particularly in the Bronx, Harlem and the Lower East Side. They are also located in New Jersey, cities like Union City, North Bergen, Patterson, Passaic, Elizabeth, Jersey City, and Perth Amboy. They are also located overseas in various countries. They are the second biggest gang with Dominican descent behind the Trinitarios, and started beefing with the Trinitarios around the year of 2000, but were supposedly cool with each other back in the day during the 1990s. The Trinis, and DDP's been going at it for years in New York City which as you already know are gonna include several murders between them. There is the murder back in 2005, where DDP supposedly murdered Gil Lanier, and as revenge Maria Maya caught Miguel Perez, who was allegedly a DDP member, and was caught by Maria, and other Trini members, and killed Miguel as retaliation for Gil. That same year there was another murder prior to the murder of Miguel Perez, and that was the murder of Marvel Martinez on April 12, 2005. He was murdered in the morning on a subway platform in the Bronx, and was waiting with his two friends for the train on their way to school. Marviel was only 17 years old. They were attacked by alleged DDP members, and they killed Marviel with machetes and knives, and they tried to stab and wound his friends while they were trying to escape taking off, running for their lives. Marviel Martinez was waiting on the uptown number 4 platform at 183rd Street and Jerome Avenue with his two friends, and was stabbed in the back. Marviel was confirmed to have died 20 minutes later in the Barnabas Hospital. One of Marviel's friends was stabbed in his arm, as he was running down the stairs and the other one was stabbed as well a little bit further from the staircase, it was speculated to be about a girl. Only a few days after the murder, there were three teenagers charged for the murder, the teens were identified as Alex Ramirez, who was charged with second-degree murder, assault, and criminal possession of a weapon. Bolivar Pichardo, who was charged with murder, and Lucas Dennis, who was charged with murder as well. In 2007, mid-October, a 15-year-old boy killed by the name of Jose Batista in Upper Manhattan, Friday night appeared to have been caught in a shooting between the Trinitarios and DDP. A 16-year-old boy was also shot, but made it just fine. The shootings took place outside 522 West 134th Street near Broadway. Witnesses said the teenagers were hanging out with others on a stoop outside the building, when shots came from a passing car. Members of the Dominican street gang Dominicans don't play live in the building. According to witnesses, After this unfortunate set of events, things were only getting worse in Manhattan City High Schools, with chaos even spilling out in the Tony streets of Gramercy Park, and Chelsea. The schools would become a battleground for the rival gangs of Trinitarios, and the Dominicans don't play a gang. There would be more than a dozen altercations between these two gangs, which led to one getting killed and a dozen getting injured of some sort, and this was under the span of three months. The NYPD investigated confrontations between the two groups in and around Gramercy Park, Chelsea, Harlem, the Morris Heights section of the Bronx, and, most frequently, in Washington Heights. Then there was another case of bloodshed on January 7, 2008 around 9.30 a.m., 
at West 196th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue, in the shadows of George Washington H.S. Several DDP members approached two teens asking if they were Trinitarios, and then proceeded to stab them both, causing minor injuries and an arrest was made in connection to the incident, a young man by Alberni de la Cruz, and was only charged with assault and was only 17 years old at the time. The first murder that we know of in 2009, was in March, as a man of Raymond Casual who vowed unfortunately be killed, as he was ordering Chinese food. Shortly after he got his food from New Young Hong Kitchen at 271 West Kingsbridge Road Raymond stepped out onto the dimly lit street, and was promptly shot in his chest and back at 9.18 p.m. the hot bag of food he'd been clutching fell to the pavement. Raymond collapsed beside it. Workers in the Chinese restaurant ducked for cover while police and paramedics sped to the scene near Bailey Avenue. The shooter escaped amid the chaos. Later that night, at New York Presbyterian Hospital's Allen Pavilion, Raymond became the year's first homicide victim. In the 50th precinct. In the days since the killing, Raymond Casual's family and friends have vented their grief on the social networking website MySpace. My heart is broken and has gone dark, wrote Mr. Raymond's father, Raymond Casual Sr., age 42, of the Bronx. My son Ray, was my heart and my friend. I miss him. Benny Chan, a cook at New Young Hong, said Raymond was a regular customer there, and never appeared to be in any kind of trouble. A makeshift memorial with pictures of a smiling Raymond, and friends, dozens of candles, and handwritten messages like gone but not forgotten, was sitting outside the restaurant at the time as a tribute. He seemed like a good, friendly guy, Mr. Chan said. I made him the same dish a couple of times. Chicken fingers and rice. I wouldn't have thought someone would want to kill him. Mr. Chan had been cooking in the rear of the restaurant, when he heard the gunshots. He thought they were just the sounds of children playing, until a co-worker told him a bloodied customer was lying on the ground outside. Mr. Chan quickly took cover in a nearby bathroom afraid an errant bullet might strike him. I was scared, the cook said. That was the first time I've seen something that horrible. Police believe the shooting was part of an ongoing dispute, between groups of young men, who hang out in the neighboring 52nd Precinct, which includes the neighborhoods of Bedford Park, and Fordham. New Young Hong is near the border between precincts. Raymond had two previous brushes with the authorities, according to arrest documents, on May 10, 2006, he was arrested, and charged with criminal possession of a weapon after police allegedly saw him holding a gravity knife. Three days later, police charged him with resisting arrest, disorderly conduct and harassment after they allegedly removed him from the scene of a street fight, in the 52nd precinct. The outcomes of the cases were not clear. It's not known what transpired before the shooting, but police say Raymond's killer was ready for him, when the 8th Avenue resident stopped in Kingsbridge to buy his dinner. The attack on Raymond Casual was supposedly a retaliatory attack, as he was a rival gang member of the Trinitarios, but from what gang is unknown but has been rumored to be a DDP member, and was involved in an altercation with a Trini member that day. The one who would later get convicted for the murder, and was arrested in connection to O Operation Patria, which was a huge bust of the Trinitarios but I will dive into that later. 
The man who would get arrested for orchestrating the murder of Raymond, was a man by the name of Javier Beltran, and is a member of the Trini subset Chicos Malos. He served as a treasurer, and as first of the Chicos Malos and, in those roles, funded gang activities, such as buying weapons and recruiting members, and participated in several non-fatal, but violent attacks. As I've said Javier was supposedly the one orchestrating the murder, but wasn't the initial killer, the Trinis gathered in an apartment, and Javier gave a gun to Luis Beltran, which is the younger brother of Javier and basically told him to kill Raymond, they all went into two separate cars, and went to their destination, as they pulled up, Luis got out of one of the cars and pulled up towards Raymond, and shot and killed him, got back in the car and they quickly drove away from the scene. Javier was later sentenced to 10 years back in 2013. In April of 2009, there was a double murder, who included Juan Mano Gonzalez, and Edgar Fernandez and were at the age of 19, and 20 at the time of their unfortunate demise, and were shot by a hooded man as they walked in front of 109 to 51 54th Avenue according to authorities. Fernandez died on the scene, and Gonzalez expired later at New York Hospital Queens. Both of them are speculated to be members of the Trinitarios, but the authorities believe that the killer was either a Latin King or DDP. That same year there was also the murder of Jonathan Ruiz, May 6, 2009, police were called to Tiffany Avenue and D. 165 Street, in the confines of the 41 Precinct in Bronx for a 911 call of a male shot at that location. Upon arrival, police determined that a 17-year-old Jonathan Ruiz was found unconscious and unresponsive, shot once in the leg by two Hispanic males, who fled the scene. One of the shooters was Johnny Nunez Garcia, aka Superior from DDP. Superior was a member of the elder family set of the DDP gang, an enterprise that distributed crack cocaine, and other drugs, and carried out shootings, robberies, and other acts of violence, on and around Elder Avenue in the Bronx, New York. On June 5, 2009, members of the DDP gang attended a party, and got into an altercation with individuals they understood to be members of the rival Trinitarios gang. These suspected rivals, who included Jonathan Ruiz, fled down the street, but Superior, and his accomplices pursued them in a car. Once the DDPs caught up with Ruiz, one of the DDP members exited the car, and shot Ruiz from a distance causing Ruiz to fall wounded to the ground. Superior then ran over to the wounded Ruiz, stood over him, and shot him again. Superior left Ruiz to bleed out, from his injuries. Although this happened way back in 2009, it wasn't until this year that Superior was convicted for the murder of Jonathan in March. Superior will spend time locked up in 27 years for the murder of Ruiz. The year of 2009 was wild, as the Trinitarios were responsible for three murders that year, they also lost a few of their own to a couple of killings as well, by their rivals. There was also the murder David Avila Gomez in Yonkers, New York. In September 4th, David Avila Gomez, was murdered and three Trini members was convicted of various racketeering charges, murder, conspiracy to murder, attempted murder narcotics conspiracy, and firearms offenses. The convictions stemmed from an investigation by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's ICE, Homeland Security Investigations HSI. The jury convicted Felix Lopez Cabrera, Carlos Lopez, 
and Luis Beltran of charges arising out of their involvement from 2003 through 2012 in the criminal activities of the Bronx Trinitarios Gang BTG. The BTG was involved in drug trafficking, and multiple acts of violence, including attempted murder, in Manhattan, the Bronx, and Yonkers. As Luis killed Raymond, Lopez Cabrera is responsible for the murder of David Avila Gomez, the way it went down was that Lopez Cabrera, and four other tried to rob David of his phone but he resisted, which led to him getting shot and killed on the steps outside of his home, and this happened in Yonkers, New York. Two months later there was another murder in the Bronx, in November 29, 2009, an innocent kid by the age of 17 years old were unfortunately about to lose his life. Issy Ariel Dominguez, was walking home from a party early Sunday morning when a gunman fired into a crowd of people, striking the teen in the head, at the corner of East 182nd Street and Valentine Avenue, less than a block from his home. It is believed he was killed over an altercation that he wasn't involved in. He was in the wrong place, at the wrong time, his sister said. Issy was supposedly standing alongside some individuals, who had allegedly committed a stabbing, two weeks prior to the shooting, three Trini members pulled up, and shot towards the crowd, and Issy was the one who was unfortunately struck and killed from this unfortunate incident. Issy had no prior records and was clean, so he is speculated to have been innocent. This shooting was towards DDP members for attacking and stabbing a member, and the one who would end up getting arrested for this is Christian Nieves, aka Eric Rosario, aka a white boy. In March of 2010, Another innocent man would get murdered through a stabbing for saving a 16-year-old from the street violence and would unfortunately pay with his own life. A hard-working father of two, who was about to get engaged to his girlfriend, was stabbed to death trying to rescue a young family friend from a pack of bloodthirsty teenagers from the Trinitarios on a Bronx street. For saving his life, we're going to take yours now, one of the attackers allegedly told Orlando Salgado before coldly plunging a knife into the Good Samaritan's chest, said his heartbroken girlfriend, Brian Alice Roman. The 16-year-old boy, was standing on East 197th Street near Webster Avenue at 10.30 p.m. Friday when he was confronted by a group of trainees that he fought with earlier in the day, according to the authorities. Salgado was supposedly a neighbor, and a friend of the kid's mother he saved. He stepped into the melee to protect the boy, and was stabbed twice in the chest, as one of the attackers allegedly made the grim promise to kill him for intervening. Three young men were later arrested for the murder of Orlando, Hugo Cespedes, Manuel Geraldo, and Hargalus Vargas. That night, members of the Trinitarios gang, held a meeting near the intersection of 164th Street and Sheridan Avenue in the Bronx. After the meeting, several gang members had gathered in front of a grocery store, when Vargas pulled up in a minivan. Vargas informed the Trinitarios that a rival gang member had tried to attack him and asked for help retaliating. The others agreed to help Vargas out as their code states that, if one of them bleeds, they all bleed, so they were determined to retaliate. Those gang members had recently formed their own chapter, or set of the gang and were eager to develop a reputation as, ruthless, violent, and tough. By the time they arrived at 197th, and Webster, Geraldo and Cespedes had knives, Abru had a hammer, and Flores had a metal pipe. 
The group discussed who exactly the problem was with, and affirmed that whoever they found, they were going to take care of it, everyone in the van was hyped. As they exited the van and started lurking for ops, Vargas identified a man on the street as the rival gang member, who had tried to attack him. The individual they found was a teen by the name of Raymond Hernandez, and was a member of the Latin Kings and was walking with Orlando Salgado. Hernandez was able to run away, and the Trinitarios set upon Salgado. In the course of the attack, a brew hits Algado three or four times in the head with a hammer, causing him to drop to the ground, Flores hits Algado with a metal pipe, and Cespedes and Geraldo stab Salgado. The attack was fast, because Salgado was knocked out, and the police were coming. After attacking Salgado, the Trinitarios returned to the van and the driver took off quickly, and drove them to the vicinity of Fordham University, during the escape. Cespedes threw the knife he had used to stab Salgado onto the Metro North train tracks. The gang members later reconvened at 164th and Sheridan, where the group discussed the attack, and Geraldo bragged that he had stabbed a guy to death. The next day, the gang learned from the local news that Salgado had died. The indictment charges of the Salgado murder, as a murder in the second Dregory, the Federal Criminal Code, defines murder as the unlawful killing of a human being with malice aforethought. The parties agree that the murder of Orlando Salgado arose out of a premeditated attack. And the evidence compels that conclusion. The defendants decided to retaliate against a rival gang member for attempting to attack Vargas, spent 10 to 20 minutes driving to a different part of the Bronx, armed themselves with knives, and tools they found in the vehicle, and searched for the rival gang member on foot for 10 to 15 minutes, before launching their attack. The more difficult question is whether the evidence adduced at the Fatico hearing is sufficient to establish premeditated murder. This question is a close one. For the following reasons, the court finds, narrowly, that the facts are more consistent with second degree, than first degree murder. At the Fatico hearing, two gang members involved in the attack testified credibly about their intent, but their testimony was inconclusive. Sosa testified that he was indifferent as to whether the retaliatory attack would entail a murder or non-fatal assault. We were going to find whoever was responsible for attacking our member, and we were just going to go take care of it, we were going to retaliate. We were just going to find the person and at any means we were just going to take care of the situation, be it a beatdown or a gang assault, murder, whatever. He attacked one of us, so now it's our turn to attack them. When pressed, Sosa eventually stated that once he saw the tools, he knew this guy wasn't going to survive and that the gang members were going to kill him, but his testimony did not establish that Sosa's subjective intentions were shared by others in the group. Indeed, according to Sosa, the only conversation among the gang members was hyped to the effect that they were going to take care of, or take down the rival gang member. There is, therefore, no convincing basis for imputing Sosa's intent to kill to Cespedes, Geraldo, or Vargas. When we got into the van, my expectation wasn't to go there, and take somebody's life away, but as I grabbed the hammer, as Cespedes and Geraldo had knives, and Flores had a pipe, we was really going to hurt somebody that night. And me personally, since we was a new chapter, I wanted to build a name for myself, so people could think I'm a tough guy, because at the moment that's all I used to care about, said Abreu.
When I got the hammer, I wanted to kill somebody. I wanted to hurt somebody real bad. According to Abru, his intent to kill emerged, when he found the hammer and decided to arm himself with it. None of the other gang members, who attacked Salgado had that experience. Cespedes carried a knife that he apparently regularly carried on his person, Geraldo carried a knife that Flores had given him, and Vargas was unarmed. Further, Abru could not recall any discussion, that would have alerted the other gang members to his murderous intentions. Because the direct evidence does not clearly resolve whether the gang members intended in advance to kill Salgado, the court turns to the circumstantial evidence. This evidence is, the court finds, more consistent with an intent to assault than an intent to kill. As noted, it is beyond dispute that the gang members planned an attack. Notably, however, they declined to retrieve the firearms they had stashed in the vicinity of 164th and Sheridan. Instead, they armed themselves with knives they regularly carried, and tools they happened to find in the van. In hindsight, a fight between six men with four dangerous weapons, and one unarmed man appears destined to end in death. But at the time the defendants entered the van, a vehicle they had never been in before, they had no way of knowing what weapons, if any, they would find there. When they exited the van to search for their target, the defendants had no way of knowing how many rival gang members they would encounter. Indeed, Sosa testified that Vargas reported that he had been jumped by some guys, at one point describing the altercation as a whole block thing. Further, Abru explained that he grabbed the hammer from the van, because he thought there would be a lot of guys on Webster Avenue. In light of these facts, the planning activity, although plainly indicative of a premeditated attack, does not support an inference of premeditated murder. The conclusion to this is for the foregoing reasons, the court holds that the Salgado murder qualifies, as a second-degree murder. In preparing the pre-sentence report, the probation department is respectfully directed to calculate the applicable guideline range accordingly. In 2010 and May 23rd, two 19-year-olds would unfortunately get murdered. Two young men by the names of Rafi Tavares and Irving Cruz, the murder took place in the vicinity of 81 East 181st Street, Bronx, New York. Felix Lopez Cabrera, a.k.a. Sustancia, Carlito and Flaca Loco conspired to murder Rafi and Irving, and the one who shot them was Felix Lopez. Lopez Cabrera encountered Tavares and Cruz during a standoff between members of the Trinitarios, and individuals believed to be members of a rival chapter of the Trinitarios. Lopez and Lopez Cabrera chased Tavares and Cruz while Lopez Cabrera fired shots that struck and killed Tavares and Cruz. Then there was the murder of Freddy Polanco, in November that same year and Lopez was convicted of conspiracy, and substantive counts of murder of Freddy Polanco in aid of racketeering. The evidence established that in November 2010 Lopez agreed to retaliate against Polanco after he disrespected members of the Trinitarios, and that when Lopez and fellow Trinitarios came upon Polanco in the lobby of a building, one of the Trinitarios shot and killed him. Lopez was a brutal and highly ranked member of the Trinitarios, and had no remorse for human life whatsoever. The Trinis as a whole is one of the most brutal gangs in the US and has shown time and time again that they are willing to take on the challenge and reach whatever heights that has to be reached to reach their goals of taking over and having that dangerous reputation out on the streets, even to a point where rival gang members have linked up to take them on. Lopez was later indicted in connection with Operation Patria, but this will be covered in the next part and this is probably everything for today. I just want to thank you guys for your patience, and I will be working on part 2 right away and hopefully be uploading part 2 as soon as possible. This video was about the start of it all and a little on the beefs and history of the Trinitarios. There is a lot more to uncover about this vicious and brutal gang in New York and I'm excited to put in the work to bring the videos out quicker for you guys. Rest in peace to everybody that was killed out in the streets, and lost their young lives to street violence. This is everything for today, until next time.
make sure to like and subscribe, and please leave a comment as well for anything you want to see in the future. Also don't forget to follow the socials, and catch me on Patreon as I will be giving those willing and early access as it takes time to get a video approved for me and will be posting more explicit content on Patreon. Thanks.